There's a pole on the way, maybe we should swap sides. We always do it from that side. Oh, there's some lighting in there too. What factory is it today? You know, RB factory, Z factory, cooling Z factory. Z factory. I painted your calipers the wrong colour factory. Sheet metal factory. Sure. All of those things. Pick one. Allen factory. Frustration factory. Give me one. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Z factory. No, it's meant to be today on. Yeah. And then we'll cut to the credits. That'll definitely upset at least half of our viewership, calling it Z, and please the other half. Today on the Z factory, there was no heart in that at all. <laughs> Come on. Today on the Z factory, we're getting stuck into some sheet metal. Whilst I've got peak engagement at the start of the video, this is an announcement for our end of year live stream. Thursday the 28th, 4 till 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Jump online, drink some lemon squash with us, ask us some questions and enjoy some banter. We'll see you there. Welcome back to the Skid Factory. We're deep down the rabbit hole of trying to make this Z and RB work together. Uh, it is proving to be quite the challenge to get this cooling system sorted out uh, with limited space and uh, the added annoyance of having air conditioning to deal with. So, but I've been, um, I've actually spent so much time just staring at it, trying to trying to envisage what it's going to look like and how it's going to work. But I think I've, I think I've got there now. Uh, we've started making some uh, sheet metal shrouding for it just uh, in the last couple of days with the help from Matt from Rogan Industries because we don't have the gear to do this sort of stuff here. So the plan is, you can see the radiator set up here. It's the radiator that we were talking about using. It is, is a, it's a real, a very wide, but um, not real high radiator. Uh, it's probably a little bit undersized, but time will tell, but it is kind of the, the only size that really works in there. Uh, the original radiator setups, neither of them will work because they basically will be clashing with the engine. So I've got this one sort of tucked in under, basically where the um, condenser would have been for the aircon originally. Uh, fortunately, these things have got this huge deep nose, like the bumper comes out to about here somewhere. So there's a lot of space, but it's low and wide space. So we've had a, a fair bit of um, thinking about where to, what sort of shape of radiator to begin with, then the air conditioning unit. Uh, condenser as well and I've come up with of all things guess what a Subaru condenser um, I just went and saw Luke at Noosa Radiators and we sort of cracked open a few boxes and he happened to have this one here um, which is for an XV which is like a Impreza sort of outbacky looking thing it's actually the same as a Gen 4 which is what Gus's car is so um, that actually fits in there quite well, so I've made some brackets and stuff to make it work. Well, it's actually using the original bracketry and just made some um, mounting tabs for that. Uh, and then, we, of course, we've got the intercooler out the front. We've got a Plasma Man Pro Series. Um, so that fits in there really well. There's, as I said, there's a lot of space in the front of the car, but um, just it's just a very specific shape space. So. Mounting it all, I was scratching my head. I don't like having all these brackets and stuff going everywhere. So I thought I'd make a sheet metal plate to go underneath it all. And then that sort of launched into the more of the idea of we're gonna need to make ducting for this to maximize it, its cooling efficiency because the radiator is probably not the ideal size. So um, many trips over to Matt at Rogan Industries to with some um, mud map drawings and a lot of folding up of little bits and pieces. They're all bits that still have to go in there. Uh, there's some weird things with this car because it because the air filter air box assembly used to be here when, when it's a V6 and there's a lot of there's intercooler pipes coming in the side and then there's intake pipes going under the headlights and it's a and, we've mentioned many times insanely complicated sort of setup 
So there's a lot of massive air leaks in here now where the, because there's no pipes or anything in there anymore. So we've got to basically cap all those air leaks off. So we end up with air coming in here. The only way that air can escape is through the radiator. And that's going to give the radiator its best chance at, um, at maximum efficiency and keeping the engine cool. So I've got some uh, push fans on it. They obviously won't fit on the other side. So push fans aren't ideal. It's definitely better to have them as a pull, but um, these are very powerful Maradine fans that we got from Raceworks. Um, they do blow a gale and um, they've got really big motors on them, as you can see. They're fitting in there all right. Matt uh, folded me up a couple of little things that I welded onto the radiator. Um, so they're, they're in there and they actually fit in the space really well. So I'm. I'm I'm pretty happy that, that they're going to do the job they're designed to do, even though they're in a, in a push situation. Uh, the air conditioner goes in between, and then we've got the plasma man. All of uh, the intercooler and the aircon are all mounted to this, which slides right under and is bolted to the lower radiator support um, through like the lower or the radius arm mounts. So it's pretty sturdy, and the front bumper bar is basically runs through there so we'll fill in these sides and all the other little air leaks and I've got this panel here that goes in the top here very 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 tightly make a couple of more mounts to stop it flapping around this bonnet latch as you know these things do they actually do a lot more work than what you think keeping that bonnet shut so they've got to be pretty sturdy we've removed the upright that goes down to the lower lower support panel so i'm going to mount it to this panel here which will then be tied into the rest of the of the setup so it's an extremely fiddly job but in the case of this where you know that you you've got a bit of a deficit as far as cooling you've got to make the extra effort to make sure that radiator works as well as it can. Uh, we'll have an oil cooler here. I was wanting to put it here, but it just didn't work out. So it's just gonna have sort of your generic oil filter, oil cooler there. Um, these had huge intercoolers here on either side. So the whole car is designed to bring air into those so they work. So it shouldn't be a problem to sort of make that um, cooler work as well as it can. Why didn't you put a, another additional radiator on the other side, a little go-kart radiator? A little heater core. Yeah, it's it's a possibility. Um, we'll see. Sorry, I'm just being in the comment section now. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's helpful. It's actually there's a lot of ways to get around um, cooling system problems, which we've sort of discussed as far as all cooling and that sort of thing goes. You got to you've got to really look outside the square. You can't just put bigger and bigger radiators in. It just does not work. So um, in a car like this, you got to yeah. Sometimes, as you said. You can put an auxiliary radiator in, such as a heater core, because that's all a heater core is. It's just a radiator that keeps, stops your feet from freezing up. And uh, there's also you know, many other ways you can go about it. If you look into things like mid-engine cars, like Porsches and stuff like that, they, they have some very creative ways of keeping, keeping those things cool. They'll have a main radiator. They've got a nose that's this low, so they've got a radiator there, and then there's two in the pods as well. So. If you look at it from an engineering point of view, there's a lot of ways you can go about um, defeating the problem that you're sort of dealing with, such as this. Let's get and make some more brackets. Hopefully try and finish this up. I've, the other thing I've done is pulled the entire wiring loom out of the front of the car, which is absolutely enormous. Um, and most of it won't be there anymore because same as the Laurel, we're using an R3 ECU and everything is powered out of the ECU. So you just do not need these banks of relays and all that sort of stuff that they, they needed back in the 90s. So I'm going to strip all that out and we'll hopefully we'll make that wiring loom much smaller because there's a big fuse box here and there's a lot of wires running in and out uh, underneath the headlights there. And I need that space for intercooler pipes and, um, and also intake over this side. So we'll uh, pare that down and... Um, Stick it back in and start making other things. Well, what about the brake lines? Uh, we've also, yeah, we, we haven't got the brakes working yet, but we've replaced the lines with um, braided Teflon lines from our local part shop has a brake 
machine that they can make the whole thing that are all ADR certified and that sort of thing. We, I think we showed you the line last time, but when you've got a, a normal brake line, the longer it is, the worse it's going to make your pedal feel. And these have a big sort of convoluted sort of setup. Um, so in this case, this, those lines are going to make that pedal feel a lot better and make your braking performance better. If you've ever ridden a motorbike, if you've got a Japanese bike that's got rubbish, like rubber lines that go all the way down to your front wheel, the brakes feel like rubbish. You replace that with a uh, like a braided uh, Teflon line. The, the pedal, the, well, the the lever feel in this case is vastly improved because that it does swell. There's a, there's a lot of pressure in your braking system, particularly in a car where you've got uh, you know a big hoof pushing on a big lever with a booster and everything. Uh, so. It's well worth um, investigating getting some lines if you want to improve your brakes if they're marginal. I'm about to start on the intercooler piping. Uh, I could do the hot side uh, straight away, but I have to wait until I get the inlet manifold for the cold side. But before I did it, I had to um, clean up this front wiring loom. Um, the plate, the spot where it passes through around about here. Uh, I had to open them up so I could fit intercooler pipes through there and also get rid of the fuse box. There's only a couple of fuses and relays left. So I'm just gonna have them separate and mount them somewhere out of the way because the fuse box that goes here is massive and we need that space for other things so now that I've done that I can um, get stuck into that intercooler piping I'll start with pulling the compressor covers off um, chopping the outlet ends off them and welding on some uh, Wiggins like plasma clamps and um, then I'll start with a sort of a Y piece off those two turbos that'll join into a single three inch so that'll take a fair bit of time it's pretty fiddly and there's not much space so I better get stuck into it tacked up a couple of uh, outlet pipes for the compressors as well as cutting off the housings. Um, these will have a, a joiner in between them because they will expand at different rates. Uh, now I've got to really like lock down where these turbos are going to sit as far as movement that way etc goes and um, I've, I think I've got a bit of a problem here with the way the wastegate's orientated on this one. Um, Brendan made me two sets of manifolds with different wastegate positions. Um, both of them work okay in a skyline, but uh, this one is probably going to be an issue just for the dump pipe to go out because where he would have routed it in the skyline, there is actually a big pad in the cross member for a, an engine mount that the VG30 has, which of a skyline obviously doesn't have. So I might take that turbo off and pull that manifold and try the other one and see if it's weight wastegate positions better it's actually coming out here but it should be okay because that pipe goes under and that one can go sort of over the top of it so I'll give that a try and see if it works better The other manifold was a bit too different from this one for, for it to work um, with the rest of the current setup so I just decided to chop off the the wastegate outlet which was down here and just trim it down, shorten it, put it in the right place for this application. So we'll bolt it back on and continue on. I've made a bit of progress on this intercooler piping but before I did it I had to mock up the um, 
sort of dump pipe path just to make sure I knew what was going on. Um, so the problem with this rear one, which is why it looks so shit, is because there's uh, air conditioning lines coming out right where the, the exhaust wants to go through. So I've had to carry a little bit of a funky path there with some pie cut stainless bends. Um, I don't like pie cutting, it's ridiculous, but sometimes you've got to do it. Uh, I've also removed the uh, battery box here to account for that being there. Um, we are going to stick the battery in the back and that will probably be like a catch can there uh, that doesn't isn't susceptible to dump pipes being right next to it. On the uh, intercooler pipe side of things here, obviously we've got two turbos so we've got to join them into a single pipe which is, uh, is pretense presents its potential challenges um, so what I've done is just freestyle something in there um, and then cut it back then try and figure out how to make that join into the three inch there so I split a piece of three inch uh, narrowed it down to probably around 70 mil so it slipped inside that plasma clamp there and um, then that matched up to the twin two inch merge much better so now all I've got to do is join the back turbo to the front turbo I do run a another joiner there because those two turbos will move back and forward with uh, exhaust expansion and also even if you made that perfect and welded it it probably wouldn't fit anymore so such is the joys of melting metal together Progress, slow, but we get there eventually. All right, I got the probably the most difficult part of the intercooler piping tacked together now. I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, got the merge, uh, Wiggins clamp or whatever you want to call it, whatever brand it is. Another one there, another one there, another one there. Um, you see, I've got just hose clamps holding them together. That's a trick that we picked up off Dave from FFM. Um, these things have a lot of movement in them so if you just put them together without the o-ring you end up with it rattling around and hanging and that sort of thing and it it can sort of uh, do you a disservice so to speak uh, in the fabrication side of things so I've just chucked that clamp on there that's the final join just to show you that it's all together uh, once once they're all welded up and everything obviously we'll, we'll they'll have o-rings on them and then the o-rings sort of uh, it allows movement but it also limits it from like dangling around so uh, it's probably this is is a pretty good idea if you're ever using these now to weld that up and then i'll move on to the next bit of it which will be this front section here That's the cold side completed, apart from, or well, hot side actually it is, apart from the air filters which I'm waiting to come from Raceworks. Um, we've got a fair bit more stuff to do. I've written a windscreen list which is traditional for a project that you're aimlessly wandering through. Uh, we have got a couple of uh, surprise gifts turn up. Uh, people felt sorry for us struggling through this Z project and other people have experience with them. Uh, one thing was a, a guy, Corey, sent me a clutch pedal assembly, which is uh, very, very generous of him. I appreciate that, mate. He's he's actually converting his car to auto, so he didn't need any more. That's the booster. So as I was kind of thinking, the booster is actually inside the car, which it's not on the sort of R32 uh, GDR. So that actually goes in the car between the firewall like, like this so we'll chuck that in, in there even if the booster doesn't work i think it's got a bit of a leak because of a rusty shaft but we'll try and sort that out it's still going to be better to have the right geometry on the pedal which i wasn't 100 percent that i'd i'd achieved uh, so we'll stick that in good job for woody since he's young and limber 
Uh, the other thing I got uh, sent was from Stephen at Lodge Conversions over in the States. He specialises in doing um, mostly LS conversions for uh, Zs and 350Zs and that sort of thing. G, well, G series, whatever they, those things are called, Infinity G35s. Really nice stuff. We, we met up with Stephen at, um, I, I believe it was New Jersey Raceway in 2019, had a chat. Great guy. He generously sent me this uh, shifter and cross member conversion after seeing my struggles with shortening that shifter it is a bit of a pain in the ass not really meant to be shortened so this assembly i don't know whether it's going to fit exactly yet because my where my gearbox is may not be the same as where the i'm assuming for ls's that they they move them back that'll help you though would it not well, it'll have to be part of it we'll 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 get underneath there and pull the cross member off and if that cross member works it actually uses the the turbo 400 gearbox mount so i guess i was onto onto the right thing there so we'll see if that fits um but we'll definitely probably be able to use bits of it even if we have to modify it so thanks a lot stephen you're a legend check him out if you need to do any to be fair an ls swap is the definitely the smartest thing to put in one of these things it's short there's plenty of engine bay width plenty of power than LS but uh, I'll have to tell myself that at night when I'm wondering why I can't fit all these pipes and shit into the car <laughs> never mind that so we've got uh, a bit to do we've got to do uh, battery because I've I've cut out the battery tray because of the exhaust path on the back turbo um, wouldn't have been a problem except for the car's going to have air conditioning and the air conditioning lines come out of the firewall right right there so I've had to sort of divert it this way and then go down and the battery tray was in the way there so uh, picked a few spot welds out for that. This is going to be uh, a catch can position so we'll use the space uh, wisely. Battery in the boot, um, we'll probably go into super cheap and get a DIN battery. That's normally what I use in stuff that's got to go inside a car. It's actually a battery that's designed to be inside a car for European stuff. So it's all sealed and has a, like a, a, a vent drain. So you can just plonk it in the back of the car and strap it down without a sealed box or anything like that. So we'll grab one of those, uh, run some cabling up. Woody's already put a post, like a, a bulkhead post hidden in there. That, what, that used to be where the throttle cable came through, which is obviously not required anymore. So that will run through down to the starter motor. We'll then run across to the Nexus R3 VCU, which needs its own power supply as well. And uh, Woody's also made a throttle cable bracket, which credit where it's due, we copied off uh, Ryan from RK Garage, who did the same pedal into the Laurel that we did uh, the wiring on a couple of weeks ago and it's exactly the same pedal and same bracket system and it actually it's a very simple arrangement and works really well with that Raceworks drive-by-wire pedal so plenty to do let's get stuck into it hey is that eight ball in the turbo is that like a fandangle t50 eight ball mod yes t58r you you're absolutely correct <laughs> imagine the whistle that one would produce i'm gonna try it <laughs> <laughs> Out of balance. We've got spare thing. turbos. <laughs> See how long it takes to fall off. How many you got? One, two, three, four, five. Is that six? No, nah, it's four. Okay. That's enough. We'll only do it once. Are they all 2863s or is there a 3071 up there? No, nah, same as this. All 2863s. Do you want to sell them? Now time to say buy my turbos. Well, if, you, if you can, you can buy them. Limited how much? Cool. Limited edition Toyota. Engraved. That's not existing anymore. One of twenty. Probably twenty. How many did you have to get made to get your name printed on there? <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Lodge cross member is not, is it Lodge or L-O-J? Uh, whatever you want to call it, Lodge. L-O-J Lodge. Sure. Okay. Uh, the, I've got the gearbox really far back, as far back as it can physically go um, in the tunnel. 
it's also ploughing into the firewall. So I'm, I'm guessing that that's not the case in the in the what this these things are actually made for, which is usually LS conversions. So it is a little bit further back than that that cross member that um, Stephen provided. Uh, this shifter uh, will work though. The only problem is I would need to probably take the gearbox out to grind off bits and pieces of old shifter so we can use this billet piece here that's uh, been supplied with it. So that might have to wait until a later date because the gearbox is not easy to get out. It basically requires the whole everything to be dropped down significantly. So uh, that shift is going to work for the moment and I'll just keep this until inevitably I have to put a clutch in it or something and then we'll swap it over then. Uh, probably worth noting with these, if you're ever doing anything with a Z32 gearbox, uh, like these get used a lot in other things like SR20s and that sort of stuff. Um, this, the way that this shifter bracket plate is designed, it does not require an anchor. So this shifter that's in the car now, it's uh, got like pivot points here where it bolts to the gearbox and then it needs a bracket to hold it up into the floor, which is also rubber mounted you can't not have that because the shifter will just flop around this because it's rigid basically just it holds the shifter simplifies the whole thing especially if you're putting that gearbox into a different car so definitely worthwhile for more than one application so if you've got one of those horrible sr20s and your gearbox keeps blowing up which i know it does uh, and you're going to use one of these boxes then this is probably a good thing for that we've got a couple of things we need to uh, start doing a bit of uh, heavy cable wiring. Uh, one of them is a battery because you need to know where to put it so you can run your uh, cabling to the right place. So we'll go to Super Cheap and grab one of those. Uh, we'll, we'll use a DIN battery, which is something that's designed to be inside the car. Um, and that way you don't need a sealed box or anything like that for fumes. And I think we might grab a stereo as well because the, I think it's got a CD player, which is kind of cool, even though I was around when CDs were invented but it's also got speakers that no longer have any actual paper or anything present, which is pretty standard for a car this age. So I might just grab some, some speakers and a, and a new head unit, get it up to modern age. I think probably the best thing about these modern head units is you need to have connectivity to your phone and stuff like that so you, you don't use your phone when you're driving. If you're in Australia, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're anywhere else in the world, you basically get thrown in jail if you use your phone while you're driving here. Thousand dollar fine it's, in Queensland. It's uh, significant and loss of license and all that sort of stuff. So having your phone away and it, everything you need displayed on that uh, head unit is is actually a, a big deal for us. So what about a subwoofer? No subwoofers. Um, you're getting way too carried away with the quality of the car. <laughs> it's already got two turbos. You don't need subwoofers. Now that we have some supplies from Super Cheap Auto, we can get stuck into the interior. So we've got a DIN battery, which Al mentioned before. We've also gone for a Sony head unit, XAV3200. This is Apple CarPlay and uh, Bluetooth remote, all that kind of stuff. That's a good head unit. Also just some speakers for the stereo. Uh, we've also got some battery terminals. You can get plenty of different battery terminals. These ones were found to be the, the best ones. They're forged brass. They've got a they've got one bolt on the top for the uh, to bolt your terminals to. So these work with the battery well. He's also got a recessed part on the on the battery too. And Al's got we got these hold down bolts, but the way these batteries usually get held in is they've got like a uh, bracket from factory i don't know where it is but al's got one somewhere which we're going to use most likely in the back so we've got to run some battery cabling from this is the positive stud which this will power the starter motor and the alternator and everything else in the engine bay also i think there's like the standard wiring loom i think this stuff will get connected to this too but we'll run that in the interior back. I've just pulled this interior up. Also, pro tip, if you've got electric seats, 
make sure you remove them or put them in the correct position before you disconnect all the wiring and the battery because it's a pain in the butt. So we've got the carpet up. We're gonna run some battery cabling through here. There's a little void under the seat rail mount there. So the cabling's gonna be running along here, all the way up the back. And I believe the battery is gonna be in the boot on this side, I believe. Um, there is a bit of rust in this corner, which Al is gonna to have to repair. So I think we're gonna incorporate that into the repair into a bit of a custom battery box. And these are the speakers too, which we're replacing. So these are like a six by four, I think, or like two or something, six by two, I think they were. We're just gonna replace those with, Al ended up just getting a four inch speaker. So we've got sixes for the front, fours for the back. It's not an auto salon, crazy stereo car. He just wants something to play some music basically. So the double did head unit in the front there and um, get it going. So I'm gonna get stuck into some battery cabling and then when Gus gets back from work, he's gonna fit the head unit because he's done it in his patrol and now he knows how to do it. So job's on, let's get him done. If you're tackling a battery relocation at home, there's a few tools you need. One of them is a hydraulic crimper. So you can buy these online, readily available. Go halves with your mates, hit them up to buy them with you. Uh, cable, battery cabling. This stuff is two BNS or 32 millimeters squared. I'm not too sure what gauge that is. You can look that up online. Everyone specs it differently with different numbers. And also a cable lug kit. So you can get, this is one from Super Cheap Auto. These are great, readily available. This is a bit more of a workshop kit that goes right up to your big dog ones. So you'll, what you'll need to do is cut the sheathing off the cable, slip your lug on, then grab your crimping tool, crimp this on. Then what I like to do is starting from the back of the car, I'll run this cable in the required location all the way to the front of the car. You're ready to make noise, aren't you? Run the cable all the way to the front of the car to that uh, battery post. Then I'll tidy it up and pull it all back so it's neat. And then I'll cut it off at the end where the battery is. That is just to minimize wastage. This cable is expensive, so you don't want to go making a guess and then having, you know, 500 mil left over, which you're never going to use. So you can use it for earths and stuff too in the long run, but minim minimize the wastage of that cable would be the best thing to do. All right, you can make a noise now. What are you doing? Why didn't you paint that? Once you've got the light crimp, it's always a good practice to use some heat shrink. I know someone's gonna get upset that it's not red heat shrink, but this is your double insulated gluey stuff, so. Also, if you're gonna put a jump pack on a battery, you should know which is positive and negative regardless of the color. Just because it's red doesn't mean that that's positive. It could also be a negative. Where's Joseph to come and move all this stuff? Make some room. Um, yeah, that's. He's got to. You got to fly him back up from Tassie now. Isn't he here? No, he's just gone back home. Yeah, I'm just going to run it there, up against the seam, and then down this way. Or did you want to go up through here? I'm easy. But it goes up. Yeah, it'd be right there. Yeah. So this is straight from the battery, and then from this, we'll power the and then a Nexus R3 over the other side of the car. I'll also put a boot over that. Not that anything can really get in contact with that, but. So now that's in position. I now work my way back by getting it in the right spot. So it's running along the, the panel here next to the washer bottle and the rest of the stuff, which we will secure in the end. And Alan's gonna get a length back there and chop it off. We just laid some um, split conduit over the top of the battery cable. This is required sometimes, but not always. Um, it just if you're suspicious about it uh, ever coming in contact with anything abrasive, then put some on it to save yourself the worry. In this case, we're running it through here where it's running through there, up the front to where Woody is and past the seat, because that's where you usually have an issue. Um, after that, it's going, getting buried up in the top of uh, the dash there where it shouldn't be any issues. No one's tampering with it sometimes. 
Sometimes that's the worst thing. It just falls short of that bracket here, but... No, pull it. No, it's just there. When it comes to battery grounding, you you can't really have too ma too many grounds. It's only just a matter of diminishing returns. Uh, we're running, we're using the chassis, like the, the actual body of the car, as as the as the ground to the battery. It's there's nothing wrong with doing that. It works perfectly fine. It's all made of steel. It's very conductive. You just got to clean off the paint where you're putting those um, the terminals like so on the back there we got the battery negative up into the body cleaned off the paint bolted on securely all good down this end we're running one from the starter motor so the starter motor draws a lot of current so it's good to have the uh, the ground straight like very close to the starter motor itself in this case it's actually bolted to the the tab of the starter motor that's holding that's holding the starter into the engine and we've got another one coming off the alternator. Nissan's run a, a ground off the alternator. I don't know exactly why, because you probably don't need it, but they do these things, so we're just, we're just running an, an extra one uh, off the alternator itself, which is also grounded to the block and straight to the body there. So that's plenty. Um, you can go nuts and put as many as you like on there, but at some point it's not gonna make any difference, but at what point that is, you'll probably never know. So if you want to spend a lot of time and money, you can add lots of grounds. It's not going to hurt anything. <laughs> Why are you giving me shit about my 10 grounds? Oh, no, well, one of, some of yours were there to, they were like <laughs> tilt limiters for when you tilt the engine. Yeah, that's better that than that. Wasn't, it's better was, that, that. was that supposed to be a ground? I thought it was just to stop the engine falling over. <laughs> it's better that than the radio. Because that's, that's what it was doing. <laughs> Well, I found a squirrel in the shed. <laughs> Where'd he get sidetracked, that punk? so hard to do. <laughs> is it working or not? Made wide up R5s that are easier than this. Well, how about you concentrate less on wiring the bike and maybe wire the dash in? No. The bike is important. <laughs> Fix it. We've made some pretty reasonable progress on the car given we're still missing a few bits. The plasma man inlet manifold is on its way, so as soon as we get that, we can bolt that on, and that'll allow us to do a lot more uh, stuff like finish the piping, and also uh, start on the wiring, because obviously most of the, the stuff is on the inlet manifold, so we're waiting for that. Um, we have just had our uh, Haltech delivery turn up, though, so we've got a whole bunch of goodies here. Uh, keypad, always a good idea. Uh, we've got a Nexus R3 VCU we're going to use on this. It's the, pretty much the right, right thing for the job. Uh, we've got a, an IC7 dash. I've also got a Mako um, dash mount for it. So we're going to remove the, the, the original uh, instruments completely and um, replace it with the IC7. Bunch of sensors and solenoids and whatnot and the big wiring loom. So uh, one of the things that we have... Just Woody and I have just been discussing is where to put the ECU because uh, there is a huge area for an ECU to go. There was in fact four ECUs or four control units underneath a false floor on the passenger side. But in this case, because we've got twin turbos and all that stuff, and it's very busy in that area. Um, the actual grommet point where it, where it comes out of the firewall is right where the exhaust dump pipe is. So. Um, it's meant to come out here. That's obviously not going to be practical with that with that turbo and dump pipe right there. So what we've decided to do is something which we don't do very often is actually mounted on the on the um, the driver's side of the car. So that allows us to come straight to the cold side of the engine, which the inlet manifold will be here. There's no room down um, there, brother. The, the <laughs> one little problem we've got is where to put the the grommet through the firewall. Uh, and I think I've found a spot for it. It's actually, there's a, there's a grommet going through with a bunch of plugs uh, inside the inner guard there. So I'm going to make another grommet hole above that and the 
engine wiring will go through that and then come up through the sort of relief hole here where the where the other wiring comes through and then it can run along and do its thing on the on this um, sort of inlet manifold and that sort of stuff um, so we will sort of make up some some sort of bracketry or something to hold the ECU up there. There's actually a fair bit of room hidden up underneath there, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, we can then access our power point that's right there pretty easily, which is good. Uh, and um, I think I've just got to power up the fuel pump to the back of the car. So that's going to be a relatively simple wiring job from from by our standards, so um, that shouldn't take too long. By our standards, you mean your standards? By my standards, yeah. A lot of wiring, the right. complexity is relatively low, let's say that. So, um, yeah, we got, as soon as we get that stuff, I think we're pretty much going to get stuck right into it and try and get it to a point where we can fire it up. What about that front bar? Show me that snazzy heel side thing. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so I found this front bar pretty, pretty close to me. Um, the... My friend in um, New Zealand, Glenn Hodges from the lab, is uh, a bit of a Z guru, and he told me that the factory front bars are really bad for airflow, and um, generally cause problems with. Um... Can you put this on. Yeah, should be able to put it on. Sure. They cause problems with when you're sort of working the, the the vehicle hard, or track racing, or whatever. So he suggested it's a good idea to, to find a different bar. So. This is a, well the brand is Twins with a Z or a Z, so it's got some pretty big mouth hole there for the intercooler and um, well the intercooler is supposed to be here of course but uh, I'm going to put an oil cooler on this side and, and put a duct to it uh, and obviously it needs some repair and paint job and the lips missing off the bottom of it but I reckon I could probably make another one of those so I think that looks really good. That should do the job. Um, I'll get Shane to tidy it up, and he, he's pretty good on the fiberglass, so we'll um, tidy it up and make it suitable for the job. So that looks sick. I like that. Stay. It's all coming along. Uh, there's a bunch of junk in the back of the car that's upsetting me at the moment, but we'll... Once we get all the fuel pump and everything sorted out, we can start putting the uh, the rear of the car back together. So uh, we might have to get Joseph to come up and put it back together yeah. since he pulled it apart. Flying back up, yeah, go for it. <laughs> It'll be worth it because I don't want to do it. I'll do it. It's easy. You're probably going to see this around about Christmas time. So uh, if you uh, are having a break, have fun, stay safe, drive carefully. And uh, sometimes Christmas isn't the greatest time for everybody, so if, you, if you've got a mate that's having a tough time, make sure you check in on them, have a beer, and uh, give them a cuddle. We are going to do a Christmas live stream or end of year live stream on Thursday the 28th of December between 4 and 6 Australian Eastern Standard Time. Work it out if you're anywhere else other than Queensland. <laughs> so join us for that. Um, ask us questions live. We'll... Uh, talk some rubbish and drink some lemon squash. See you then. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. So as did you say that bulkhead connector was it six or eight mil something like that? <laughs> it's not six, eight mil. Six mil plus. <laughs> it's three plus eight. Plus four drill hole sizes, <laughs> four step drills. Seems like you're not meant to film though. Cool. <laughs> Come on, man. Pretty sure you're just calling Gus dizzy. I am. Yeah, I know. I thought that it was an eight though. Is that 10? One more. One more, I think. Oh! Damn, my socks now. Clean the other side Yeah! Oh. Good job, Alan. I'm here to help.
this um, felt types, is it felt? Fluffy type, berry type. It's uh, perfect for inside the vehicle. If you're in the Redcliffe area, um, go see Whitey at Whitey's Wiring. He will be able to hook you up. He'll have heaps in stock. Good stuff.